Dear friends, I'm Shanice J. Thank you so much for tuning into Love Her Will, the new voice of willpower. Today, I'm so honored to introduce Ms. Kaneen Jacobs-Lewis. She is a young breast cancer survivor. She, wor she works full-time as um, for a nonprofit for breast cancer survivors, and she's also a single mother of a daughter. Welcome, Kaneen. Nice to meet you. And nice for, I'm so happy that you're here today. Oh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Thank you. So tell the viewers a little bit about yourself. Sure. I um, am, like Shanice said, I'm a 42-year-old uh, breast cancer thriver. I am a single mom, single divorced mom of one daughter who's college age, um, about to enter her sophomore year. Um, I do work for uh, a nonprofit breast cancer organization to assist those who have been affected by breast cancer. And then I'm also um, a baggie ambassador for For the Breast of Us, um, the first uh, support group for women of color who have been affected by breast cancer. Wow, that's phenomenal that your advocacy is just phenomenal to be able to not only thrive through what you've been through, but to also turn around and just give back to the other women that are, that are going through breast cancer. That's just phenomenal. Love her well, uh, outspoken gonna tell you how you feel, no fake news, no, no, no. well power gonna get you that real, black girl power in hills, everyone's equal, that's how I feel, black girl power in hills, everyone's equal, that's how I feel, gotta love her well, you gotta never quit love though, well. you gotta love her well, say that, you gotta love her well, you gotta love her well, solid, you gotta love her well, you gotta love her well, connect with your willpower, you love her well. I say you look beautiful today as well. Likewise, likewise, Thank sis. <laughs> Thank you. So let's go back a little bit. So when and how did you discover your breast cancer? Sure. Um, I was getting ready for a holiday Christmas party and just felt my lump while in the shower. I've always wow. done um, breast uh, exams on myself. Um, my grandmother uh, was affected by breast cancer and eventually ended up passing from MBC, metastatic oh, wow. breast cancer. Yeah. Um, and so I've always done the checks and that day I just happened to fill a lump and I was like, mm, mm. I'll, I'll check back. And so I went to the party, enjoyed myself. Mm -hmm. And then it was still there a couple of days later. So I made an appointment with my gyno <clears throat> and then, um, I already kind of knew the moment I touched it that it was cancer, but I needed to be confirmed. And wow. so when I got in there with my gyno, um, the fact that she was like, all right, so I'm going to send you downstairs, then I'm going to send you here, and then I'm going to send you there. I ended up spending like an entire day wow. uh, getting tests and going from office to office. And that is when I technically knew, but it wasn't confirmed for like a couple of weeks later. Wow. Mm -hmm. And did you have a feeling that it was breast cancer because of what your grandmother went through or it was just kind of like just a random like gut feeling that you just had? A little bit of both. Um, I never I don't recall my grandmother because she passed when I was like six months old. But um, my my dad always spoke about her and I learned he always told me to make sure, you know, we were prepared for if that could happen. But um, it was more so the gut feeling, like I, I yeah. raised my hand past it and I was just like, and I kind of knew I, I, like in my, in my gut, in my heart, I felt that, but I was like, maybe you're wrong, you yeah, know, but yeah. in the back of my head, I'm like, yes, it is. It right. is. Wow. Mm -hmm. Do you remember how you felt when you first heard those words, you have breast cancer? Yes, I do. I, um, I remember she came in the room and I'm thankful for the breast surgeon um, and doctor that I have because I'm a very direct, don't beat around the bush type person. Mm -hmm. She opened the door and she was like, Kaneen, you have breast cancer. And she gave me a minute because even though I knew it to have it confirmed, it, it, it just hit me. But immediately the first thing I thought of was my daughter. 
who was a junior in high school at the time. And yeah. we live in a state where we don't have any family or anything like that. So I just wow. immediately thought like, am I going to be here to see her graduate from high school? Will I be here to see her go to college? Will I be here to see her dreams come true? Yeah. And that was what my initial thoughts was. It wasn't necessarily about myself. It was more mm-hmm. so for her. Yeah. Wow. And so you were alone in the office when you got this news. Mm-hmm. And I'm thankful that they did it. They gave you the news in person. How long after was it after your test? Did they confirm that it was breast cancer? Um, so I, it was like right after Christmas when I went to the gyno and I went through all those tests, it was probably confirmed. Like matter of fact, it was January. I wrote it down January 15th that I found wow. out. Wow. So what, two and a half weeks? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. And- how difficult was it to tell your family and friends about this? It was hardest to tell my daughter. Mm-hmm. I had already started a conversation to let her know I found the lump. I'm getting it tested. We're going to find out, um, you know, and if it's cancer, we're going to fight. We're yeah. going to do what we got to do, but I'm going to still be here. So we had kind of already had the conversation and she knew that day I was going in to get the results of all the tests. And so I think I told her, like, if I find out, I'm going to come right up to the school, <clears throat> which is exactly what I did. I went up to the school and I think the lady at the front uh, uh, front office could tell, like, like I was anxious. And so yeah. she was like, well, why do you want to get her out of class? Like kept asking questions. And I was like, lady, if you just don't go get my child. <laughs> right. <laughs> and she, she kept asking questions. She said, what's wrong? And I was like, well, since you must know with attitude, you know, because I'm, mm-hmm. I'm trying to hold back emotions and tears and all of that. And so I was like, I just got affected by breast cancer. And I promise you, God must have been there for me through them ladies because immediately her and like four other women came from around the counter and just yeah. swarmed around me and hugged me. They were all breast cancer survivors. They were wow. all. Wow. And so they were just like, um, you know, wanted to let me know I was supported, wanted to let me know that I wasn't alone and that, and that if I needed them while talking to my daughter, that they could be there. And I just told them, you know, I'm good. I can talk to her by myself. I was like, but if you see her over the next weeks, months, whatever, and she's emotional or anything, just be there for her when I can. And so they were like, we got you. Anything she needs, wow. you tell her to come straight to us. <clears throat> and so then they finally called her. Yeah. And she came down and um, she says, if you ask her to this day, that the moment they called her down, she knew that I had it because I wouldn't be there if I didn't have it. Yeah. And so we walked to the car. As soon as I got in the car, I just told her and we cried. And then um, we went and got our thing is like sushi and okay. snowballs. So we went and got sushi and we got snowballs and we just talked, you know, about you know, whatever she wanted to talk about. I was just trying to be strong for her, trying to um, know that she was supported, to let her know she was supported. And then I told everybody else, my family and friends and all that. And immediately my family just swarmed around me. Um, My friends just swarmed around me and let me know that they were there for me. Yeah, that's such a blessing. (laughs) Mm -hmm. And look at God to have that for you immediately at the school. I mean, that's just, wow. From people that I didn't even know. Like I've seen them in the office, but not to the point to where we, we talk, you know, we spoke Mm -hmm. other than me saying, you know, I'm here to see, you know, see Calista. I'm here to get Calista. Other than that, I never said much to them because we didn't have any other, other, other commonalities. Right. Um, But I'm thankful for them to this day. I always, um, whenever I went back to school, I always kept them abreast of where I was in a journey. And then mm-hmm. when, when I finally was in ED, I um, made sure that I went back in there and told them as well. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> That's, wow. That's a blessing. It really is. Mm-hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, how did your daughter stay strong through all this with you? Because I get that you have a strong personality and I, mm -hmm. I can just see you just kind of just pushing along and and um, how was she throughout all that? She at the beginning, like most people in my family and my friend group, they held their true feelings to themselves. Mm -hmm. But I know my baby. And so I was like, she's not speaking to me about anything. I kept asking her, like, you OK? You got yeah. questions, you know, anything? And she was just like, no, you know, and basically just trying to be there for me. And that was basically the, the reaction uh, that I got from everybody. Yeah. And no yeah. one was really speaking their truth of what they felt, what they were worried right. about until finally I was just like, I need you guys to be normal. I need you guys to yeah. talk to me about what you're thinking about, um, you know, so that I can let you know what's going on. Um, and that's when I decided to start using my social media uh, platforms as my journal so yeah. that I could speak to friends and family without having to repeat the story 75 times. Right. Um, and then I could also let someone know who did not have the support I had, you know, that they're not along and not that they're not alone and that, um, you know, there's another person going through what they're going through. Right. Right. <clears throat> and, you know, that's so brave of you to, you know, not be so private about what you were going through to kind of vocalize what, you know, what you were feeling just, uh, yeah. you know, for of other women. And yeah, that's I, I just felt I, it's not easy at all. Um, my thing was I'm a, I'm a Christian, I'm a God fearing woman. And my grandma always said more prayers, the better. And so I figured let everybody know one, because I have a huge family and we're all across the country and islands and whatnot. And so that was one way I could tell all of them at one time, everything like today was this or today was that. Mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, it gave me, you know, a way to get my thoughts and my feelings out without um, not necessarily having to worry about, you know, what someone may be thinking or questioning or anything like that. I was just able to just say whatever was going on my mind at that time and it, right. it usually was a distraction from like sitting in the waiting room before you had surgery or sitting in a waiting room before you go have chemo or radiation you know it was a distraction because I could write while I was sitting there waiting right and you know like I know there's a lot of waiting with there, this is. Mm -hmm. there is mm -hmm. it really is and um you got to be able to occupy your mind in this in a way so you don't get lost in the feelings of, you know, sadness or even anger um, yep. for what's going on. Yeah, um, very much so. Do you know, um, well, did you test positive for any genetic mutations? I know you knew. I did not. That. Wow. I did not. I actually had the BRCA test um, a few years prior when I uh, ended up having a hysterectomy, I had the BRCA test okay. then and that I didn't test. And then when I went to go, once I found the lump and I went in to go see the surgeon, I brought my test with me so that she okay. could review the results and see if, you know, there's anything there or anything like that. And I didn't, I didn't have it. Wow. Mm -hmm. So you had, a, you had a grandmother that went through breast cancer but then you still did not test positive for the mutation. Wow. Right. Yeah. Wow. And that's so unexpected as you would think that you would have. Exactly. And I find now that I'm in this community that that tends to be the result of a lot of people, you know, that they don't have any of the genes, even though they had a familial history of it. Yeah. Um, they didn't have it. Wow. And what, what stage were you? Um, what, um, are, Originally, I was stage one when they when she first came in the room, she said, you're stage one um, invasive ductal carcinoma, mm -hmm. ER, ER positive, HER2 negative. By the time I had my lumpectomy, I was stage three. Wow. Mm -hmm. And how much time was that in between that? Do you, can you remember? Um, it was a month, like a little bit, like two days shy of a month. Yeah. 
Wow. Mine was really, really aggressive. Like, yeah. Um, when she held up the images of when I was getting the test, like December, January, mm-hmm. to what they found when they went in, you can see how, you know, how much it had grown. And yeah. I just, I thank God that I was um, diligent about staying on top of it, getting in to see a doctor, not waiting, not postponing, just right. because I didn't want to hear the result. Because if I did, who knows what could have happened, you know? Right. right. It could have definitely been further along um, because, mm-hmm. yeah, invasive ductal carcinoma is very aggressive. Mm-hmm. And it, it changes so quickly. Yeah. Um, so mutate so quickly. Right. So viewers, like she said, you have to be like Kaneen said, you have to be do, uh, diligent about your mm-hmm. health. You have to ask questions. You have to kind of push the doctors to do the testing and yes. you know, whatever needs to be done. To- yes. And you have to do your part of, of knowing your body, yeah. knowing yeah. your body, um, to where you notice whenever there's any change in it, whether a lump, a bump, darkening, you know, dimpling, anything of that, and not just your breast, your whole body. Right. You, you need to know your whole body so that you can recognize when there's something wrong. And right. that's something that I, I strongly encourage and I tell anyone that I come in contact with, know your body, male, female, it does not matter. Know yeah. your body. Mm-hmm. Exactly. And so what was, what is, and was your treatment plan? At that <clears throat> point? I, sure. Okay. Um, my treatment plan was uh, that I would have a lumpectomy first because it was so aggressive. And then depending on what they found, um, if I, when they tested my lymph nodes, if there mm-hmm. was cancer in the lymph nodes, I would have to do chemo and radiation. If there was no cancer in the lymph nodes, then I would just do radiation. Um, so then after they tested five of my lymph nodes in one, I had cancer. And okay. so I had to do chemo and I had to do radiation as well. Okay. And when, uh, when was your last um, day for that? When did you finally finish tr- all your treatment up? My last day of treatment was October 30, 2019. Okay. So that's what I consider my cancer bursary. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And did you... Um, did you have to do any long-term plans with the, with, um, with your treatment? Um, I know sometimes they have you do hormone therapy for a while. You did. Yeah. I have to do hormonal therapy. I take tamoxifen <clears throat> for the next 10 years. So I'm about to hit two years in October that I've been taking it. And, and then I, yeah. some of the side effect medication I'll probably be taking for the rest of my life. Yeah. And how are you dealing with those side effects? How's your like everyday life? Uh, I would say uh, I'm probably, I tell people that I live at a seven daily. Like that's, that's my norm. I'm, I'm always in pain, um, like bone joint pain, um, as well as I have neuropathy that was induced from the chemo. Mm -hmm. I now recently developed lymphedema. Um, I have severe hot flashes. uh, And um, I also have insomnia as well. So, um, and all side effects of the chemo and the medication I still have to take, the tamoxifen, that's, those are my side effects. Um, but I'm thankful that while they suck, um, it could be way worse. And so I'll take those side effects. I will deal. Um, but no, I live at a seven. Very rarely do I have days where I'm a 10. But yeah. when I do, those are harder days. Um, yeah. Very hard days. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, you know, I want to reiterate that Kanina is working full time while she's battling while she's going, you know, dealing with those daily um, side effects. Um, She's working full time. I work three jobs. Oh my gosh. Three. (laughs) Yeah. I work three whole jobs. That's the life of a single mom um, in this day and age in in 2021. And while I also was getting, while I was going through my treatment, I also finished my master's. You know, I needed something to, like you said earlier, 
to uh, kind of escape. And yeah. what I more so wanted was something I could have control. Because I didn't have control over me, my life, my body, my thoughts, or anything like that. Not that you ever really do, because, mm -hmm. I mean, when do we? But in my head, I was like, I need to have control over something. So let me finish my master's or start my master's and finish it. And so that's what I did. Wow. Um, you know, on but I did not, through my journey, I did not work all three jobs I worked one and then I picked up the second one and then I picked back up the third one okay. so um but yeah I worked three jobs wow yeah. wow and you mm -hmm. know sometimes when, like, most breast cancer survivors we're not only going through breast cancer we have other things in our lives that we're going through just like your your breast cancer thriver as a single mom mm -hmm. and I can't even imagine you know how that was just being able to balance everything you know, emotionally. I mean, what were some yeah. of the emotions that you had while you were going through treatment? And uh, it, it was horrible because um, you don't want, and it was not just with my child, but with anyone that cared about me, I did not want them to worry. Mm -hmm. So I, I didn't share always what I was thinking, what I was feeling, what I, whatever, I just did not share it. And so it was lots of times that I cried silently at night or in the shower or in the car yeah. uh, or, um, you know, just masking it basically. And then for me, I felt like after a while, I just pushed it to the back of my mind. I'm definitely a compartmentalizer. And so I push it, put it in a box and put it in the back of my head. However, once I um, was in ED, October 30, 2019, um, I, it all, all of the emotional stuff started to rush to the forefront. I found myself to be very angry. I found myself to be depressed. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, you know, you're always worrying about fear of reoccurrence, you know, anxiety about scans that are coming. Cause at that time I was getting them every three months. Um, and then COVID came. <laughs> and so, and that right. on top of it, trying to keep my child encouraged cause this was her senior year in school. So prime is canceled. Graduation was on the verge of being canceled. It was just yeah. postponed for months, you know, my family can't come and see me because of the fact of COVID. Yeah. Um, you know, it, it was really hard. There was a lot of isolation with that. So then when you're going to appointments and things like that, when normally you may see some of your, your oncology or radiation friends in a waiting room, now it's just you. There's right. nobody else there because they're, they were literally like timing us out to where we were never in there together. And so yeah. it was very isolating and um, which is what made me start looking for a support group, which is how I found uh, for the rest of us. Cause prior to that, I was not trying to have um, or to be involved in a support group because I couldn't, I talked to a lady one time in oncology waiting room and she just started telling me her story and how she had had five, she had been diagnosed one time and had four reoccurrences. Oh, wow. And she said she was in her, her fourth one. And she said, every time I get diagnosed, I lose 20% of myself. So I'm sitting there and I'm like, so you have none of yourself, none of your original yeah. self. And this was like week two of chemo for me. Mm -hmm. So um, it just, I went into chemo and I was just bawling because I'm like, you know, this yeah. is going to be me. You know, I'm never, you know, just, just all of the, all of the thoughts or whatever. Yeah. And so after that, I was like, I'm not doing support group because I can't take, I can't, it's taking everything to hold myself together. Mm -hmm. So I can't take anybody's story right now. Yeah. So as yeah. soon as I got to the point to where I noticed that I was having the anger and the depression, like I was severely depressed. Um, I sought out the support group, which I found for the breast of us. And then I got a therapist, a trauma therapist okay. that okay. specialized in people with lifelong illnesses, PTSD, things like that. And so, um, 
with both of those, I sit here before you by the grace of God in those two. That is how I'm still here because wow, I was going to lose it easily. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. And during all this, what is something new that you discovered Mm -hmm. about yourself? I discovered um, that I have a little head (laughs) and that I can (laughs) be okay, bald. But more seriously, um, I discovered that it's okay to feel your feelings. Mm -hmm. It is okay to allow your village to be there for you because I have always been the type of person to where I I make it happen for myself. I don't... Mm -hmm. I'm not going to ask. I'm not really going to allow people to help me. Like if you were really trying to help me, you basically had to force it on me prior to cancer. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I learned that, you know, you, you never realize how strong you are until you have no other choice, but to be strong. Like I've heard that, that quote or that phrase before, but it really, really resonated with me. But like so many of us thrivers, NBC years, pre vivers, you know, survivors, however you want to call yourself, we say we didn't have a choice. You don't have any choice, but right. to, you know, to, to be strong. Because um, yeah. people are always like, you're so strong, you're so this. And I'm like, uh, am I? Because if you was battling this, wouldn't you be strong? You know? Yeah. Um, I think all the things that I have been, that I've dealt with throughout my life, when it came time to push through, fight through, survive through, you have to be strong. And I've been doing that my entire life, like all 42 years. I could chronologically point out the times that I had no choice but to be strong. Um, But it's okay to to be both, to feel your feelings and be sad and be strong. They can happen simultaneously. And I did not, um, prior to having to have that, did I realize that it was okay, that I can say I'm angry and I'm pissed, but also be very thankful and blessed that I'm still here. You know, um, those are the things that I would say I've, I've learned about myself. Yeah. Wow. And mm-hmm. like you said, when you're not given any other choice, <laughs> I mean, it's like push through or die, <laughs> you know? Exactly, exactly. And, and, and I, in saying that, like, if you decide you don't want to push through, that is okay. That's true. I, I sincerely feel that. And if you decide you don't want to take the route that they're laid out for you, and that is your choice, that is your right, that is okay. That's Nobody true. knows what you're feeling, you know, not just physically, but mentally what you're feeling and what you can take and what you can handle. Like there were times throughout this journey where I was like, I I cannot do this anymore. And I'm I'm talking to God and I'm talking to myself and I'm talking to like my nurses and the doctors and they definitely had to put the mirror up to me to show me like, you've been doing this. Yeah. You can you have been doing this, like give yourself grace, give yourself credit, give yourself um, the praise that you deserve because you're doing it. And it just reiterated that to me. And that would be my thing to push through for a week. But there was countless times where I walk in those doctor's offices, like I'm done. I'm not doing this. I don't want to do this. I don't like this. I don't know my life anymore. I felt like You know, when you see those paintings or, excuse me, those pictures where the person's standing in the middle, but the cars are like going at warp speed past their head or past them. That's how I felt because everybody was doing something or or so many things and my life was on pause. And I didn't know if I was going to ever be able to hit that unpause button. You know what I'm saying? And so... That was infuriating for me because I was coming up on my 40th birthday. I had plans for my 40th birthday. I had plans for my daughter's, you know, year and all of this. And it just, but like they say, you make plans, God laughs, you know? So. Yeah, that's true. And like you said, it's all right to have those days where you're just like, I can't do this. 
I still yeah. have those days. And getting the bed and getting the bed, but whether it's you gotta take a rest day, take a mental health day. Mm-hmm. Um, there's nothing a zone wrong out day. Right. There's nothing wrong oh. with that. It really nope. isn't in. And nope. sometimes those days is what kind of gives you a, a little bit more energy for the next to take on the next day is taken. And I do break. agree. I believe that most of the times when I was feeling that, like I was restless. Like I said, I have insomnia yeah. and I wasn't getting sleep. Like one week or like for weeks, I was getting like 10, 12 hours for a week. Oh, wow. So that makes for a very um, angry canine. That makes for a very right. moody canine. That makes for, you know, yeah, I was I was like at any moment could have snapped and hauled off and punched somebody in the face, like easily <laughs> because I was that tired. Mm-hmm. And I did not realize that I needed to speak up and say that. Like when they would ask me, how are you doing? I'm thinking more so they're referring to like uh the pains and the uh you know the site where i got my chemo or my radiation like how is that i wasn't thinking oh i'm not getting any sleep and then finally my doctor um one of my oncologists asked me he was because i guess i was like kind of like sitting up in there like you know and he was like how are you how are you sleeping i was like i'm not and he was like, how long has this been going on? I was like, since the beginning. And he was like, why didn't you tell me? I'm like, why didn't you ask? You know? Right. <laughs> and so I said, and then that, in that moment, I learned one to advocate and talk about all of the things I felt, whether I felt they fit what he was asking me or not. So I probably overshare all the time, all the time, but I would rather overshare and right. tell you this list of things than to not tell you and then right. and, and you can't help me. So as soon as I told him that, he was like, um, what have you tried? I'm like, I tried melatonin. I tried this tea. I tried that. I drank, you know, whatever. And he's like, okay, so we probably need to go to a prescription medication. I'm like, I'm, I'm ready, whatever you got. And so we finally found one that worked for me. And now, while I still have restless sleep, meaning I I can fall asleep, but I get up and down throughout the night. Yeah. I yeah. still have a better sleep yeah. than I was having for sure. Yeah. And like you said, is you have to overshare with the doctors because a lot of times they may not mention things. And you might think, okay, I'm supposed to be going through this or yeah. it's supposed to be happening to me because, mm-hmm. and then we think like that and then we don't think to say, Hey, this is going on with me. And exactly. I, yeah, so exactly. you have to just go ahead and just overshare. Say, hey, the doc, this is what's going on, and then you come to find out. Well, they're like, oh, I can help you with that. So exactly, mm-hmm. and I think it's also um, realizing that one, this man sees countless people who are going through the same thing I'm going through. He can't remember everything all the time. So give them grace at the same time. They're human. Right. They got their own stuff going on in their personal lives. You know all of that, and so. Um, I'm thankful for my cancer team. I had an amazing cancer team. I still do. Um, and, you know, once I started oversharing, that has just helped me a lot. And it's a part of advocating for yourself. It is. You have to do that, you know? It is. At any point during your journey, did you ever disagree with your doctors at any point? Mm. I disagreed. Like I was trying to get them um, to explain to me how they came up with the length of time that I had to do stuff. Um, Like where where is this chart where it says that if she fits in this bracket, Mm -hmm. she does it for this long. And so I constantly challenged that um, to where, because I needed, I'm a person that I need to know the why and how and when, and I need to know all of it for it to for me to, to, to agree or, cause I'm stubborn. I'm stubborn. I'm, I'm bossy. I'm like, I know these things about me. So you want me to get on your side, then you're going to need to give me all the details. And so once my doctor realized that I'm like that, yeah. he was like, okay. So now when he comes in, he has all types of paperwork and all this stuff to like, okay, so this yeah. is this, let me tell you why this is, cause I did chemo for eight months almost. Um, yeah, I did chemo for almost eight months and then I did radiation for, for two and a half months. 
you know. Yeah. Um, That's a long time. And I, yeah, and my sessions like for radiation was longer than everybody else because you know you get to talking in the room and right. they're like, yeah, my sessions are like twenty minutes. I'm like, I'm here for like forty five minutes in there, mm -hmm. like actually in there, um, and nobody else was doing that. But then again, me asking the questions. They explained to me, well, since yours was so aggressive, we're, we're taking a little longer time to treat the area so that we can try to, you know, decrease your chances as much as possible. So I'm like, oh, well, if you would have said that from the beginning, I'll right. shut up, <laughs> you know, but. Right. And that's, it, uh, that's so cool that they adapted to you, you know, and he didn't like say, well, you're doing this because I said so, or this is just. That would never bad. work. That yeah. would never work yeah. for me at all. I would have, I would have said one. Can you note my chart that you just said that to me? Right. And <laughs> two, this is the last time I'm coming to you. Because right. We have to remember that we are paying these people for a right. service. Exactly. Therefore, they need to to adapt to you. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they need to make sure they're they're meeting you where you are on your level. Like I, I speak to. Thankfully, now that I work in this industry, I speak to healthcare providers, nurse navigators, patient advocates. I tell them, you know, sometimes when you guys speak, you speak very high level. Yeah. And yeah. this person might be at this level, but you're you're so used to speaking to to medical staff, you know, right. coworkers and whatnot, that you're talking, you're using acronyms and jargon and all of this. You got to find out where your patient is and come down to their level right. or go up to their level, wherever they are. And, um, and, and tr basically try to get to know them. Just like I told them, I'm not a beat around the bush. I don't need you to sugarcoat it or pussyfoot for me. I need you right. to tell me straight up, like we are about to do this, this, and this. Right. And I need to know that because that is how I retain the information. That is how I can make right. peace with it in my in my head, my heart, and my body. But right. if you if they were up in there like, well, um, and so I would have been like, nope. Right. And that's what's important. Doctor. You're the you're important. Like you said, we're paying them. And so it's all about us. And yep. you have to be strong enough to be vocal enough in your appointments to to let your doctors know, hey, I need you to repeat this. I need you to dumb exactly. it down. not necessarily dumb it down, but let you know just change up your wording. I'm not yeah. understanding. Explain. Right. When you say this, this mm -hmm. means this. Like I had a, I had a, um, a woman who I spoke to who, because like most people who are not in the cancer community know stages. Mm -hmm. They don't necessarily know invasive ductal or right. metastatic and all of that. Now they're learning it more and more because it's out there in the, in the right. media. But prior to, they didn't know that. So I had a lady who had been diagnosed for like two, three years, not know that she was stage four because they kept calling it metastatic. Yeah. And, and I so, didn't know anything about metastatic when I was first diagnosed. Me either. I didn't know nothing about metastatic. I didn't know nothing about invasive ductal. I didn't know ERPR. I didn't know HER2, you know. And um, so when she said that she was sitting in the doctor's office and finally this time one of her children were able to come with her. Okay. And- the doctor said metastatic and they were like, my mom is stage four. And she was like, who's stage four? And they're like, you are stage four. You've been stage four this whole time. And wow. she's like, but why didn't someone tell me that? They're like, we did. We said metastatic. Metastatic is, is makes sense in the metastatic and the breast cancer community. It doesn't, people yeah. who are out here who have never been affected, never had anyone affected by breast cancer or wasn't um you know because everybody doesn't share and maybe they didn't know that person was metastatic you know or whatever but she didn't know and so it was a huge gut punch to her yeah. to find out that she was stage four and stage four and metastatic were the same and that um you know this is where she was like I'm telling you she got severely depressed mm -hmm. because of that mm -hmm. but prior mm -hmm. to that appointment she knew she had cancer but she right. thought that she was like, I guess like a zero or something like that. Like, I don't know what she thought or it wasn't anything that she needed to worry about. Right. You know, yeah. now she knows that it has spread it, has yeah. spread I mean, to different areas of her body. And I just felt so sad for her yeah. because 
it's not her fault she didn't know those words right. or those right. acronyms or anything like that you know and that's where it is the dude you know the the doctors the the medical staff who needs to be cognizant they need to probe they need mm-hmm. to you know so do you understand what we're saying you know let exactly. talk to them like you would talk to your mother, your sister, your kid, whatever, right. you know, your wife, right. If your right. wife is sitting there giving you a dare, dead and hair headlights eyeballs, then that may mean that she's not getting it. Or if she's just right. like, oh, okay, it's like, no, no, no. Did you just hear what I just said? Yeah. You know, they need to take that time. And, and again, this is another thing I appreciate about my cancer team because I never felt like, you know how some doctor's offices you go in and it's like, all right, let me get this 10 minutes and I'm going to the next room. Like, yeah, that's how it feels like you were yeah, just rush. a long yeah. line in all of their appointments throughout the day. Right. My doctors are actually like, they come in, pull up the chair and like, let's talk. Let's make yeah. sure yeah. you're good. And however long, and I come in with a list. <laughs> I'm that girl. I come in with questions. I come in with things that I found in a book or that you mentioned, somebody else mentioned, and I'm going to ask it and I'm going to keep asking questions until I understand. Right. So everybody doesn't know that. I just think about the lady who, who um, speaks another language and English is not her primary, you know, and didn't know that she needed to bring an interpreter with her Right. right. or the lady who never graduated you know, high school or middle school, or, you know, the lady who is dealing with some other stuff, you know, so she can barely even hardly take in what you're saying. Right. And then just, just the women going through it during COVID who haven't had a chance to bring somebody with them to their appointments to help them take notes or exactly or Or low ins, you know, low to no insurance, you know, Um, or dealing with someone who is not, uh, good with dealing with people who are of different races and ethnicities, you know, and so they're treating you and they're half, you know, half giving you the same service that they would give to someone else because you're black, you're Hispanic, you're Indian, you're whatever, you know, um, or you're LGBTQ or something like that, you know, people putting their own biases that's preventing them from giving the care that they should be giving to you simply because you need the care. So, yeah. Um, did you ever, oh, that's not what I was with to ask. I already asked that question. <laughs> that's why I write things down. That's good. <laughs> so we know that cancer can affect our self-esteem in many ways. What gave you a boost of confidence during chemotherapy to continue to fight and complete your treatments? I would say I did. I didn't have the okay. confidence. I, I, I'm just starting to a little now, okay. um, because I don't, I don't look like me to me. I don't, yeah. people are like, you look good. You look beautiful. You look happy. You look this, but to yeah. me, yeah, I do yeah. not see myself. And so it's a daily, daily thing that I have to go, go through, but I am also a part, a member of the class of fake it till you feel it. Um, so you know, I fix my face to try to lift my spirits. I mm-hmm. pop on some earrings that say something so that I can lift my spirits, you know. Yeah. Um, but during chemo, I felt like it was just breaking me down. Like, yeah. level by level by level by level. I lost my eyebrows. I lost my eyelashes. I lost my yeah. hair. I gained weight because I had so much steroids while I was getting my chemo. Right. Um yeah the hot flashes. So now I'm a sweaty fat man, you know, or whatever. Um, The fact that my body just does not feel like my body anymore, even though overall, I, I'm, I still look a lot the same. I do not to me, to me, I just do not see myself and therapy friends. Um, and just giving myself grace is allowing me to kind of get there. But mm-hmm. I would definitely not say that I have the same confidence I had prior to. No yeah. way. Because I'm I'm bigger than I've ever been in my life. I am bald. You know, I just realized yeah. that my hair will not fully grow back in. I tried to let it grow for almost a year. 
and I basically had a moon, like a, a, a U, and yeah. a little bit at the front, but it would not connect or fell in. And so that, that, that affected a little bit because just like your hair, I miss my braids. I miss yeah. my braids. I used to live in braids. I had an afro, I had a curly afro, and yeah. now I don't have that anymore. And, um, you know, uh, the fact that I don't have eyebrows and yeah. my eyelashes have just started to try to come back. And yeah. um, it's, it's just a lot that does not look like me. Like right. the fact right. that I'm even, if I wasn't having these hot flashes, these arms would not be out. You know, lymphedema is affecting this yeah. arm. It's just, it's thing after it's thing after thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so, I and, mean, yeah. I'm trying, yeah. you know. And thank you for being so honest. Um, no and the key thing you said, we don't look like ourselves and we don't feel like ourselves. Yeah, I might look good to you. And when people say that, that oh, you look good for what you're going through type of thing. I guess they have an Im- uh, image in their mind about what mm-hmm. cancer looks like. Mm-hmm. Cancer may look like, okay, bald and frail. Like yeah. you don't have any weight on you or you're sickly in the bed all the time. And mm-hmm. I think they have that kind of image in their mind. So when they're like, oh, you, yeah. look, good, you look good, you look good. Thank you for the compliment, but I don't feel like myself. No, like I, not at all. I put on not so much, put on, you know, 40 plus pounds weight. I've put on 40 pounds since I've been sick. You know, yeah. we don't feel like ourselves. We don't feel as confident. You know, it. <sighs> It's a lot. And it's just like, boom, 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 boom. You know, it's a a cycle and it's a, it's a, it's a never ending cycle because just when I was like, okay, I'm about to get this gym membership so I can get this body, Mm -hmm. you know, back in the shape, I developed lymphedema. So now I got to work on learning about lymphedema and what I can do with this arm and what I can't do before I can hit the gym. Like I want to, because I, I was definitely going to be doing like some push-ups, some pull-ups, you know, yeah. all this stuff. And that may not be the best thing for me right now. Yeah. And so um, it's, it's when people, and I got, I got some, some mean people who said things to me like, I thought you said you had cancer. Yeah, I do. Wow. Why are you getting so fat? Wow. And see the, the, being that I was full of anger. <laughs> yeah. They would they they could not handle what I wanted to say to them. And I'm yeah. thankful that God did, you know, bit my tongue for me and, and kept the con- sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. You know, <laughs> but people would say stuff like that and they one, how how do you feel that it's okay for you to have the unmitigated gall? to right. come up into my right. face, to ask me a question like that. Right. You don't know, yeah. I could have beat cancer, but now I'm affected by something else. You know what I'm yeah. saying? And even if it wasn't, like I tell people, there is not one type of cancer and there's not one type of treatment for cancer. So you right. may know Somebody. your aunt who went through it and she lost a gang of weight. That's not my journey. Right. Did you know right. that I had eight steroids? Yeah. For eight months? You right. know, did you know that... The medicine that I had to take for the next 10 years, one of the first side effects is weight gain and fatigue. Right. So right. trying to battle that while you're trying to work out and, you know, or they're like, you need to stop eating or whatever. My doctor told me to eat what I can eat, what I can keep down because right. I could have easily been starving because I couldn't keep anything down because my right. mouth hurt, or throat hurt or whatever the case may be. So right, I have... I have made some, I have shut my mouth a lot, but I made some responses back to those comments because yeah. I basically let them know how rude of you. Yeah. Um, you don't know what it took for me to get dressed today. You don't yeah. know what it took for me to come here today. And so for you to say that to me, mm-hmm. you should be ashamed of yourself. I pray that you will never walk up to another human being, right. man or woman, child either, and say anything like that to them. Yeah, that's awful. You know, because you would be real. If you only knew the things that I was thinking about you and how you look and right. how you coming up in here. And if right. I said those things to you, how would you feel? Mm-hmm. You know, but people step on you to make themselves feel good. Right. And so they thought, that they can step on me. And that's yeah. one thing I'm not going to let anybody do. Be, and it's not more so for myself. Yeah. I just think of that person who won't 
come back, you know, and say something back to them. You might be the person that pushes somebody to take their life or push right. somebody right. to start starving themselves or whatever the case may be. Like, exactly. don't do that. Don't be like that. Be better. Do better. Right. Don't treat people like that. And and I'd be damned if you're going to treat me like that. Let right. I can treat me like that. Like, can you fat is all get out. But mm. you're not going to say that. Right. You're me. not going to tell me that. No. Exactly. No. And it's it's so ignorant. I, I just think it's ignorance of, like you said, people just being not educated on things and Lazy. not even and not doing the due diligence to educate themselves. Exactly. Lazy like, why don't you you heard I have breast cancer. Why don't you go Google something and look some things up? Educate, or ask. Or ask. ask. Yes. Can you, how has this experience been for you? what 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 would you tell somebody else about the things that have right. happened to you or exactly. how you feel or whatever and let me tell you you know right i had a steroids and i've gained over 40 pounds and you know i can't fit anything all i wear is stretchy clothes now like right. let me say that or on the flip side i lost all this weight you know and i'm still fighting this thing you know and it's taking everything in me just to to exist right now like oh, it is hard it's so, girl it's so hard it like some days so it is some days you just to get out your bed and go sit in the living room is a journey it is is, is a is a feat in itself and for someone so crass so inconsiderate and as i said lazy to mm -hmm. not take it upon themselves to learn about what they call themselves talking about yeah. Yeah, you you're gonna catch all this heat from me. You're right. gonna get all the smoke. I would I deliver it to you. your door in a box. Right. Yeah. Mm -mm. Yeah. I don't blame you. It's it, it really is tough and you know it's uh, it's never ending. <laughs> it isn't. <laughs> it isn't. Ending. And I and I tell people that all the time. I feel like we walk around with a scarlet C yeah. on your chest because yeah. It is constantly coming up. So during the pandemic, I had to get some dental work. They weren't going to do the dental work. I'm in pain. They weren't going to do the dental work because I had cancer. Mm -hmm. And they're scared, you know, because of COVID and because I had cancer and I'm immune, I'm immune compromised and all of this. But I'm like, I need you to make this pain go away. Like, yeah, I don't. My doctor gave you a note. Here it is. It's okay to give her a treat, you know, like do this or whatever. I had to fight to get it. I ended up having to go to a different dental office, you know, mm -hmm. or um, like uh, my job, they started offering, you know, like Aflac. Okay. We can't do Aflac. Yeah, we because can't. Because you have cancer. Yeah. You had yeah. cancer, you know, or whatever. Um, life insurance policies. Like if you can find one that will allow us it's very expensive, yeah. you know, yeah. um, because of the financial aspect of breast cancer, I had to file bankruptcy. I'm very vocal about that yeah. because yeah. the world needs to know how it can really affect yeah. you Right. so and far beyond this, beyond right. this body, you know, right. to, to where in turn that affected me when it came time for my daughter to go to school to apply for loans and things like that. You know, it's just, it's a cycle right. and, it's, and, it's, and it's continuing to punch me in the throat. And I, I basically am trying to come with terms that this is how it's going to be right. because of the ignorance, because of the lack of knowledge that the world has, mm -hmm. that when they're creating these different things, they're not taking into, into context these people who've been affected by these lifelong illnesses, right. MS, cancer, lupus, right. you know, uh, right. whatever, all these other ones, we should be put into like a different bracket right. and now right. abide by these rules for us or they have these things for us. It's, 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 it's ridiculous. And it so, is. yeah, it's so I get on my soapbox about that. It's okay. <laughs> it's all right. It's, it's true. Um, not, just because you're diagnosed, it depends on where you live, what state. You may not qualify for Medicaid. You may not qualify for disability. And it just all depends. And especially- I didn't qualify for any yeah, of Yeah, you I basically told. have to be broke and homeless before they give yep. you anything. They don't want they you to make me, anything. They told me I made, uh, what she tell me? I made $2,000 more 
than like more than whatever that that yeah. top line of it is. And I'm like, but you you're going off my taxes from last year. Right. You know, this has nothing to do with the fact that I'm not working all three of these jobs at this time. Right. Or <clears throat> even if I am working it, COVID has affected these jobs. I might not be getting as much right. time or whatever. You know, it's so many factors. <clears throat> but then on the flip side, because of COVID, <clears throat> excuse me, so many other people are needing help. So now the the line has gone down. Yeah. Therefore, yeah. I'm never, you know, it's it's just a thing. It's yeah. Yeah, it is. <clears throat> it's like you said, it's just a thing. <laughs> sure. So yeah. what has what do you think has been the toughest battle during all this? You've, this long journey you've had with breast cancer? I think it's um, the mental, the mental part of it, the mental component. Um, I definitely feel that the moment they sit down and talk with you and tell you you got breast cancer and to come up with a cancer journey, mental health should be a part of that. Telling yeah. you, you know, we have these lists of trauma or oncology therapists or psychologists or psychiatrists. And in and, and that day, you should be speaking to someone. Yeah. That day, a therapist should probably be entering a room with the doctor to be there to help you just wrap your mental around mm -hmm. so then you can hear the medical and hear the plans and all of that because it's so much. And I just think about, <clears throat> like you said, I was in there by myself and then it was just like, okay, so here are your appointments. This is what you need to do, you know, over the next couple of weeks. And then we'll go from there. Yeah, and then yeah. I just go walk out to my car. Being that I was so, um, like so many thoughts are going through my head. Like I do not technically recall driving from the doctor's office at the hospital to my daughter's school. I got there, yeah. but like remembering, so I could have easily crashed into yeah. stuff, killed somebody, whatever. And I just felt like it should have been somebody like, we're going to keep you here. You know, like when they dilate your right. eyes, and your eyes or, you know, a test or something like that. We're going to keep you here for a period of time until you really feel like you can drive or right. we're going to have this, you know, our little service drop you off at home and then you can come back and get your car or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Let us call someone to come up here to be with you or something. Right. It, it should be something. It should, but it should something definitely like be a therapist and it should be, you should be told, we recommend that you get a therapist at the same time they're telling you that we assigned you a chemo oncologist, a radiation oncologist, a surgeon, that person should be right in line with that. And I would even go so far as to say, the moment that they determine that you're gonna have to get chemo or radiation, you should be signed, assigned a physical therapist. Because had I not, again, told, overshared, mm -hmm. I would have never known what I was feeling in my arm was lymphedema. Yeah. You know, and I speak to my physical therapist who is awesome. Um, she was like, and she's a breast cancer survivor, like that's crazy, oh, wow. but anywho, um, she says that she tells every, uh, surgeon oncologist, you know, that they should send their people to a physical therapist the moment that they determine that they should have chemo and radiation. She said, because so many things can happen, you know, mm -hmm. and she could be, she could have told me things that maybe could have helped me prevent this from happening, right. you know, right. or if you start to feel this, this is what people describe it as so that I'm aware. So the moment I felt that I can be like, okay, mm -hmm. I think I got lymphedema. I need you to look at this or whatever, you yeah. know? Um, and then I was even told, you know, like us who have had chemo and radiation on the left side that you should probably be seeing a cardiologist you know, mm -hmm. to look at your heart. And they mm -hmm. said, every year you should be doing this. Again, these are things that should be said. Right. These are people who should have been in the room, you know, like, okay, Kaneen, this is your cancer team. You have a 
breast surgeon, you have a chemo oncologist, you have a radiation oncologist, you have a mental health therapist, you have a physical therapist, and you have a cardiologist. Right. And we are all going to work together to help you come out of this thing as best as you can, or help you live with this thing as best as you can. Exactly. You know, it should have been that. And so when I speak to any doctors now who are involved in giving treatment to people affected by breast cancer, that is what I say to them. Y'all need to step your game up and you do better by your patients and setting them up mm-hmm. for success, setting them up with true expectations of things that could happen. Like your hair may never grow back. You may develop yeah. lymphedema. You may develop neuropathy. I didn't know what was going on. I was like my my fingers and my arm, because like, my neuropathy, when it first started, it was yeah. like all the way up. It's scary, yeah. It is. And I'm like, and my toes are tingling and all of this. And they were like, oh, you have neuropathy. Yeah, that's one of the signs. Okay, I need y'all to give me the list. Right. Like, whatever list this is, give me the list right. of the things I need to be looking for so that I will know because I'm up at night with insomnia, which I didn't know was a side effect, Mm -hmm. trying to figure out why my fingers are tingling, you know, but if I would have known that, just think of the stress and the, the stuff that could have, that I could have avoided. Like, oh, Kaneen, that's probably neuropathy. When you go see the doctor tomorrow, tell him about it, you know, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Again, soapbox. Soapbox. Yeah. And what do you think was been the biggest help for you that can help the next breast cancer thriver? I would say it's a toss up between the village, allowing your village to be there for you, however you need and being um, honest and direct about what you need or don't need from them. Um, And then I would say boundaries, learning to set those boundaries and to stick to them. You know, um, when you don't feel like being bothered, you know, just because someone's like, hey, we we had plans to go out to dinner. You know, you didn't know today you was going to feel like crap. Yeah. You don't have to give in to it because you don't want to hurt this person or make this person not feel good or whatever. My bond, no. And I don't have to explain to you why. It's just, no, I'm not coming today. No, I'm not going to make it. No, I don't want to go. No, I don't want to do that. That is an answer. No is an answer. It's a complete answer. Um, But I would say those are probably the two things that I feel that people should know along with the advocate and a therapist and stuff. Mm -hmm. Good. I could definitely agree with all of that. Um, Like I said, you got to be your own advocate. Talk to your doctors allow people to help you and also be vocal enough to say, Hey, I don't need anything right this time. Or no, like you said, is an answer. Sometimes Mm -hmm. uh, we can feel like we have to over explain as Mm -hmm. to why we can't make it or as to why we're feeling the way that we're feeling. And a lot of times we don't even have a reason. It's just, you don't even know. Like you sitting there, I don't know why I've been crying all day. Yeah. I just feel like this. Yeah. Yep. And you're okay. Feel those feelings. And when I say no, that's just what it is. You know, yeah. and if I choose to discuss it with you, fine. If I don't want to, I need you to be okay with that. I need right. you to just move on with your life. Right. You know? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, so define the meaning of willpower to you. And when was the moment you would say that willpower activated in your life? Hmm. Um, I, I put willpower along with resilience. Um, and I would say for me, I mean, it activated a long time ago, but I think it goes in waves. Yeah. I think you go like a roller coaster up and down, but, um, in regards to this, it was after I shed those tears when she first told me you have breast cancer, I, I cried and then. I was like, all right, so what do we got to do? And I pulled out my, my phone so I could record her. And because I was like, I need to be here for my child. I need to be here. So what do we have to do? Yeah. And, and that is, that was my focus. That was what kept me majority of the time moving forward. It was for Callista. It was definitely for Callista. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I like, uh, like you said, it does come in waves. You know, I may have willpower today to get out of bed, but then tomorrow I may not have it, you know. Like, you may just have enough willpower to sit up in the bed tomorrow. Right, exactly. That may just be where you it where you are, and that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. Yeah. Um, feel your feelings. Feel how you feel. Right. Is there anything else you'd like to add that you'd like to share with the next Thriver that you didn't get to say? I would definitely say um, to women of color, who have been affected by breast cancer that, that we out here, we out here, there's a group of us, you got sisters waiting to meet you, waiting to be there to yeah, share yeah. their experience, waiting to be there to lift you up, waiting to be there to laugh, cry, scream, yell with you. Um, and, and you can definitely find that at For the Breast of Us. They're on Instagram, they're on Facebook, uh, and we have our website. And then I would also say um, through the organization I work for, Living Beyond Breast Cancer, there are so many, um, so much information there. They've, they've done the work to make it available for us. Um, in that we should definitely utilize it as well as the programs that are offered for people who have been affected from the financial assistance um, to the peer-to-peer -peer breast cancer helpline to the reading for reassurance, which is for parents who've been affected by breast cancer who don't know how to have that conversation. Um, it provides books for them so that they can get the words, find the, the ways to speak to your child at the level that they are, at the age that they are, so that it's appropriate enough to explain to them what they're seeing mom or dad go through, but also keeping it within bounds for them. You know, wow. um, I just think that there's some amazing resources out there. You're creating an amazing resource with this Thank podcast, you, you know, um, to where someone who's just affected, who's listening, you know, find out again, I'm not alone to, you know, this was this lady's journey. That may be my journey or my journey may be different, but the thing that bounds us all, we are all members of a group that, of a club that we never tried to join. Yeah. And we're sisters. I tell people every day, all day in my job, you know, when they call me, like a lady called me yesterday and she's like, I just got diagnosed yesterday. Wow. And I can hear in her voice, you know, just I could just immediately, the, the, the thoughts that are coming through her head, the feelings and all of that. And I just said to her, sis, you're not alone. We are here. You know, we are here for you, however you need us to be here. I need you to know that there are resources. I need you to know that there are people. You know, if this is not the time that you want people, that's fine. When you're ready, we here. You know, if you need resources, let me know. I will connect you with whatever I have you know, at my disposal, you know, just know that you're not alone. And I will say for me, at times I felt that. So that is like my mission, especially as a woman of color, to not be able to look online and see a picture of what my breast could look like after lumpectomy or chemo or radiation, yeah. Yeah. you know, or bald and all of this. And um, that has been my mission to one, let people know they're not alone. And then working with For the Breast of Us, create and put those pictures out there for women of color to know there's a whole bunch of us. Yeah, there's a there whole bunch of us and we have so much to share with you. Um, and if you need pictures, so you can get an idea of what it looks like on melanated breast, you know, yeah. or, you know, the scars and all of that stuff. Yeah, we got. Them. And so between your podcast for the breast of us living beyond breast cancer and all these other organizations out there. Right. There's, there's, there's people. Yeah. So I think they need to know that, that that's the thing. There's a community and, and it's not just a talk or play play. It's a community for real. If you want them, they're out there. Right. That's right. Thank you so much, Kaneen, for being on here. I appreciate you, your words of wisdom and just being able to share your story. It's not easy to talk about the things that we feel um, during this time. And I just appreciate you taking the time to do that with me. 
And no problem. Um, Thank you for having me. Sincerely, yeah. I, I truly appreciate it. Thank you for giving another Black woman a space on your platform. I truly yeah. appreciate it. Yes. And thank you, everyone, for watching. Make sure that you share, you like, comment, and be encouraged. Love yeah. her. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.